Identity creates purposeful responsibility. I want to talk about just for a second what our identity creates in us. Our identity creates purposeful responsibility. Um, <clears throat> you and me, this is a profound reality that I don't know that I get. I don't know that any of us really get it, that we are made in the image of God. That we're actually made in His image. And, and I've talked a little bit recently about a culture of freedom, grace, and responsibility. And I want to go after just responsibility for a minute. Because God has in, invited us into this relationship where we are sons and daughters. Like we are sons and daughters of God. And there's so much beautiful things about that. That means that we're not clones. I think about my three sons, especially the first two. The third one, he's only nine months, so it's a little hard to see what he's going to be like at this point. But my first two sons, they couldn't be two different birds. They're just two different. They're emotionally different. They're, one of them gets upset. One of them gets angry. One of them, I mean, they just have so many different um, uh, just personality traits. And you can tell there's different giftings that they carry. And the beautiful thing about us is that we are sons and daughters of God. We're not creating clones, but each and every one of us has a unique purpose and gifting that God has called us into. And, it's, and there's also this bigger story that we are called into that Jesus has made available for us on the cross and that we get to partner with God in this whole story of new creation and this kingdom of God that God is advancing on the earth. That we get to be a part of the body of Christ as sons and daughters of God. And this, this doesn't just, just mean, the beautiful thing is, is that we do receive it. We talk a lot about receiving here and receiving things that God has given you given us. But it's also important that we take responsibility for the things that God has called us to. That's why I love that we're doing this with the the foster care, is because it's important that we as believers take responsibility for the things that God has given us. I want to, I'm going to be in Colossians chapter 3, just to give a a little context. I I did the strength finders recently, and I realized one of my strengths is context. And every time I read something, I'm always trying to get the context of it. So I'm just going to bring you into a little bit of context of Colossians. It's not much, but the apostle Paul wrote, wrote this letter in prison. He wrote it around 60 or 61 AD. And the purpose of this letter is to equip the Colossian church to fend off false teaching and help them resist false teachers within the community. He penned this letter to remind believers of the wonderful hope of the gospel and not to turn aside or fall victim to those who minimize Christ and lead the church into empty philosophies and humanism. Some major themes that are in this, if you read through Colossians, highly encourage it. The supremacy and the centrality of Christ is all in here. I mean, Paul is hammering that Jesus himself is God, that he is God, that that's who he is, that he reigns over all creation, whether we think so or not. He does reign over all creation. He is sufficient for our spiritual life. He's the center of our spiritual life. Another powerful thing that he gets into in this is the body of Christ, that we are now the body of Christ, which, I mean, you think about that. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. The, I mean, there's so much meat in that that sometimes I wonder if we catch who we really are. He's the authority over his body. He sustains the body. And guess what? We get to carry his presence And through the church, the mission of God is revealed and advanced. And this is what Colossians Paul pens in this letter. He also talks about the Christian life. He talks about Paul teaches that our life as Christians must be rooted in Christ. And he empowers us, how Christ empowers us and renews us. And so in Colossians 3, we're we're picking up in the middle of where Paul's talking about the Christian life. And so I'm going to read some verses here, Colossians 3, 1. These are pretty awesome. It says, if, so 3 1, Colossians 3 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is, who, who is your life, think about this. This is how tied together we are with God, how, we, how much we're united with Him. It says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also will appear with Him in glory. I'm like, Paul, where did you learn that? <laughs> when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. He learned it from Jesus. Put to death, therefore, 
what is earthly in you. So put to death in you. I might jump into this a little more next week. Sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. So this is some of this responsibility for us because we have been brought into this new self, this new creation, and Paul is showing us what we should put off, what was the old self, and what we should wear. You should then put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So not only have we put off the old self, but we've also put off the practices as well. And have put on the new self. This is what's amazing. Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I might go after that a little bit. Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of, the, of its creator. Here there is no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Like we're, we're, we're all one. Everybody's, everybody's brought into the party. <laughs> Everybody's a part of the party. Doesn't matter our, our social class, our race. It doesn't matter. Like we're all we're all brought in one in Christ. Put on then. <clears throat> I, I think this is awesome. Put on then, and I'm going to go after this as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You know what it didn't say here? It didn't say put on then as sinners, as <clears throat> filthy rags, as evil hearted. You know, it said that put on, here's who God says you are, God's chosen ones, holy. I mean, that, that almost doesn't seem like that should be right, you know. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Like, I think God's almost saying here, like, you're, you're pretty amazing, so you need to put on compassion hearts. You need to put on kindness. You need to put on humility. You need to put on meekness and patience. And there's, there's so much weight in that verse right there. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love. It's what we should be. This is the clothes that we should put on every morning. Put on love. Put on compassion. Put on humility, meekness, which binds, it says, and above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I'm going to go after something a little specific, I can't say the word, specific today, but I'm I'm going to come back to some of that and hit some of these verses, and then I'm going to jump into this next week as well. But I want to talk to you just for a second about who determines who you are. You know, it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves. Like, who determines who I am? It's so important. Like, who, who determines, like, is it... Is it myself? Because something is going to determine who you are. I read this from a psychology, this is from Psychology Today. I thought it was interesting. It says, it's a little article about identity, and it says, identity relates to our basic value that dictates the choices we make. Identity relates to our basic value that dictates the choices we make. These choices reflect who we are and what we value. Few people choose their identities. Instead, they simply internalize the values of their parents or the dominant culture. I mean, that's definitely out there today, what, you know, what culture tells us what we, who we are. Sadly, these values may not be aligned with one's authentic self. I would say that they're not aligned with your new self in Christ and create an unfulfilling life. In contrast, fulfilled people are able to live life true to their values and pursue meaningful goals. So it's so important. To, it's amazing how much understanding our identity has an impact on what I do, the choices that I make. And, and I think this is a question that we all have to ask ourselves is who is determining who I am? Because if, if, I, if God is not determining who I am, then I am going to become a law unto myself. I was recently reading in Habakkuk, and it was interesting. Habakkuk's having this interesting conversation with God. It's only like three chapters. You should go read it. Um, But Israel's not doing well. There's injustice. There's corruption. And the leaders are just tolerating it. And there's this whole thing where God's about to bring the Babylonian army. And Habakkuk is having this conversation with God about it. And he's talking about the Babylonians. and And he says that they are a law unto themselves. 
And I'll, I'll read this. <clears throat> I thought this was just fascinating, that they are a, a, a law, they are a law unto themselves and promote their own honor, I'm talking about the Babylonians, whose, whose own strength is their God. So whose own strength is their God? <clears throat> He later goes on to say about himself, he says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. See, what comes from our identity is when I find my identity in who God says that I am, there's a security that comes with that, there's a strength that comes with that, and there's a purpose that comes with my identity being in God. You know, our identity in Christ is a gift that He gives us. I believe that every single one of us, there's a a longing in our heart to ultimately please God, that it's just a core need of who we are. And and God gives us His, His, His identity. He gives us this ability to be sons and daughters of God, and it's a gift that He gives us. And it's not anything, it's so fascinating because it's not, that is the fruit of the cross, It's the fruit of what He did for me. That's not something that I earn, that I have to work for, that I have to work myself up towards. No, God says that we are the righteousness of God, that we get to become in this new family, new creations, and we are now children of God. And that is a great privilege that God has given us. I mean, think about that, that you and me get to be children of God. That moves us into this place, I believe, of responsibility. And I'm going to reread this verse in Colossians 3.12, I want to re- I'm just going to reread who Paul says that we are because I, I think this speaks so profoundly to the basic core needs of our life. In Colossians 3.12, it says, You're chosen, you're holy, and you're beloved. You're chosen, you're holy, and you're beloved. See, God choosing you, that shows you, it reveals to me that God has value for me. I can tell you what you value. It's what you're willing to sacrifice for. You can find in your life, like, what do I value in my life? Where, what do I value? I value the things that I am willing to sacrifice for. See, sacrifice reveals my value. And you think about, I mean, you, you take this to the cross, and you look at what Jesus did, the price that he paid for us. I never have to question if I'm valuable to God. I ne- that never has to be a question because of what he did on the cross, the beating that he took. I mean, All of that displayed that He has value for me, and I never have to have that in question. And I believe that's one of the core longings of our heart is, like, am I valuable? Am I enough? And the answer is, based upon what Jesus did for you, is that He chose you and He picked you, and that you and me, we have value. Not only that, He calls us holy. You know, I kind of joke around, but He doesn't say, hey, you sinner. He says, no, you're holy. In Hebrew, holy... A lot of times what that would mean is that you are set apart for a purpose. When you think about Moses, when God called Moses, he's in the wilderness, all of a sudden he sees a bush, it's on fire, but it's not actually on, you know, it's like the bush is not burning up, and he notices and he walks towards it, and then God tells him to take off his shoes because he's on holy ground. And you think about this, what did, in that moment when, what was God doing with Moses? He was setting him apart for a purpose. He was calling him to something holy. And he wasn't, see, the, I think sometimes we, we can go down this path of God is setting us apart to separate us from the world. But God's actually setting us apart so that we can influence the world. So God is, is with, with Moses, it's what he did. He said, hey, I, God says, I've seen the misery, I've seen the oppression of the Egyptians on the Israelites, and I want you to go deliver them. I want you, I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to set you apart And that's what God, every single one of us, we all have something that God has called us to. We are set apart. There is a a holy calling that God is inviting us into. And I would imagine in your life you've probably felt this. I know I've felt in my own life, just throughout my life, where God has just continually pulled on my heart, where He's continually said, hey, I'm setting you aside for such a time as this, that I have a purpose and a plan for your life. Not only that, but He also says we're the beloved. I mean, that's just awesome that we are the beloved. Every one of us is looking for love. I would say everybody's looking for love. The truth is, is some don't know that they're already loved. Every single person, like God's love, like he demonstrated it. He didn't just, you know, again, he didn't just stick his head in there. He stuck his whole life into it. 
He said, I'm going to demonstrate to you my love for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son and that it's through Him that we have life. And He demonstrated that love to you and me. And so I remember one time there was a guy that I really looked up to and he was just this evangelist type. And I mean, pretty much every time I talked to him, you know, somebody had just gotten saved, given their heart to Jesus. Somebody had been healed or set free or something. And I, and I remember I would just go get around this guy and, and so I wanted to get some of my friends around him. I was like, hey, you got to meet this guy. This dude, many of some of you may know him, Jason Chin. And I got my friend. I said, hey, you got to get to know Jason Chin. And this dude just was, I mean, it was almost like Jesus to me in some ways. Not really. But, um, but he, he, was, he, he just lived out and demonstrated the life of Jesus and at, at that time probably more than anybody I'd really seen. And I remember I bring my friend to him, and my friend, and I told my friend all about him, and he gets, gets, gets close to Jason, and, he, or, and we're in conversation with Jason, and he was like, man, Jonathan tells me that you just love God. And he was like, you know what, man? You know what? I, actually, I have learned how much God loves me. And like that is the motivation of his love for others. I, I shared this not long ago, but I was a couple weeks ago, I shared this last week, I was sitting in O'Henry's and I was doing some centering prayer and just focusing on the presence of God. And, and all of a sudden, isn't it so beautiful when God just comes in the room? I don't know if everybody else in O'Henry's was experiencing this, but I was. And I was like, all of a sudden, the presence of God, I'm like, wow, God is here. This is so good. And, uh, and you just start, I mean, it's like, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm a nine too. And sometimes you, they say nines feel like they're from another planet. And I would agree. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just start, my, my mind is kind of floating everywhere, and, 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 and I'm, I, I start looking at everybody in the room, and I'm like, look at all these creatures. <laughs> look, at all, look at all these people, and, and, and just how wonderfully they're made. You know, it was like, and I didn't have this heart of judgment towards them, and, and even sometimes I know we all have those prejudgments, whether we want to admit it or not, of when you see somebody, and it, and it was like, it was, it, was, it was just love. It was just all I, could, all I could see for them was the love of God and that every single one of these people in this room, God has a plan. They are children of God. They may not know it, but they are. They may not know that they're made in the righteousness of God, but this is who God has called them. They are made in the, and it was just this love and compassion that I had for everybody in the room and that's just what God does. It's his, his, his love, and it's like when I experience the love of God, it moves me to love others. Your identity is renewed and strengthened in relationship with Him. I love this verse in Colossians 3.10. It says, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its Creator. Which is being renewed in the knowledge of according to the image of its creator. The NLT, the New Living Translation says, put on your, put on your new nature and be renewed as, as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. You know, renewed means to cause to grow up, to make new. And <clears throat> where do I, I think this is fascinating. The more that I learn about who God is, the more I actually learn about myself. Like, think about it. You're made in the image of God. It's actually when I'm, I'm in His presence. I think it's why it's so important to have a lifestyle that is exposing yourself to the things of God. That's exposing yourself to the presence of God, to a, to a worship service. To, like, I think what, one of the things that Jesus did with His disciples is, I mean, He walked on water. You know, it's like, why did you walk on water? <laughs> It's like he, he continually exposed them to, his, to the presence and the power of God. Miracles all the time. People getting delivered. Just the presence of God. Was, he was just exposing them to multiplying food, to paying taxes from the fish of his mouth, from, you know, from a mouth of a fish. He was, you know, they were catching all these fish and like just supernatural stuff. Which he, he was just exposing them to the reality of God. And what was it doing? It was revealing the nature of who God is. It was revealing what God is like. It's why it's so important just to have a lifestyle. You know, it's one of the reasons why at Oak City, you know, we, we really work to what we, we consider an apostolic environment. When you read through the, the apostles, you know, often there was miracles, there was healings, there was deliverance. The, and we work to cultivate that atmosphere because we just want to expose people through the presence and the power of God. Because what is that doing? It's revealing the nature of our Father. It's revealing His, his nature. You know, when I was in O'Henry's, and I'm sitting there ex experiencing the nature of God, like I'm learning about the love of God. 
Like I'm learning about how amazing every single person in that room is. Like I, I'm, I'm sitting there like, wow, God, this is who you are. You know, I was thinking about this. I don't, you know, like obviously there's conviction sometimes and, and God definitely brings correction at times. But I would say like in large, when I am in the presence of God, it is, it is, it, it's a love fest. I mean, it's a, it's, it's the goodness of God. It's, I don't, I don't usually get, I'm not sitting there with him and he's like, look at all these terrible people. You know, just look at, look at that guy. Look at this guy. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> You know, he's just beating them up. Like usually, like my experience of his, of his presence, and when I, when I see David and other people talk about the presence of God, in his presence is the fullness of joy. Isn't that wild? Like, that's who God is. Like, he's not up there just beating, you know, beating up people, and, and you know, they're like, yes, does he, does he bring conviction and, and, <clears throat> and correction at times to our lives? Absolutely, because we're not acting like we should. We're not acting like who we are. But in large, like God is, is this lover of us. And I think it's so important that we expose ourselves to his, presence, to, to his presence and even the things that God is doing because we're learning about the nature of God. It's why reading the Bible is so important. It's why spending time in the Word is so important because I'm growing in the knowledge of my Creator. It's why I'm just constantly reading the Bible. The Holy Spirit told me, I don't know, a month ago, he said, read your Bible. Okay. <laughs> uh, read my Bible. So it's like read, you know, read your Bible. It's it's why it's why we worship. It's why we pray. It's why we do all. It's why you practice those things in your life because you're exposing yourself to God and who He is. <clears throat> our thoughts. I, I I'll kind of land somewhere close to here, but uh, our thoughts are built off of our identity. I, I don't want to have a thought about me. Bill Johnson says this about me that God doesn't have in His head about me. Like, I don't want to have a thought that, I don't want to think something that God's not thinking about me. And I want, to, I want to build my thought life off of the way I think, the way I feel, all those things. Like, you may have feelings, you may have thoughts, but just because you have a feeling or a thought, that doesn't mean that's who you are. Like, just because I feel a certain way or think a certain way, it's like, no, I actually want to bring that back to, like, God, who do you say that I am? Like that, that's, that's what I want to learn in my life is that I am learning because the truth is that, that that's really not a condemnation thing. It's actually, it's an opportunity to become something that is a life of purpose and fulfillment. And sometimes I do, I think we, in, in the world that we live in, obviously there's a lot of that out there where, you know, you're, the, the, the cultural opinion of who you are. And, and for me, and I think is, is all of us have to ask that question is, is who is determining who I am? Who determines who Jonathan Henderson is? That's ultimately the question. Because one, one day for me, I know that I'm going to have to stand before God. <laughs> and I want to become that person that God calls me to be. And I want to live because that's going to dictate my behavior. It's going to dictate my life. And, and, and the beautiful thing of it is, is that that is a fulfilled life. That is a purpose-driven life. Rick Warren. <laughs> Come on. That'll... <laughs> Um, <clears throat> my conclusion to wrap this up I do want to dive deeper into this this week so I, I, or next week so I encourage you to read through Colossians uh, it really is it's pretty profound what Paul is, is saying and you just it's, it's so fascinating but who determines your identity anything other than God is inferior Anything other than God, anything other than God that determines who I am, it, it's an inferior reality. And it's important that I learn of who God, and God calls us into, I believe, a higher existence where we get to set our minds on things above. Number two, God says you're chosen, you're holy, and you're beloved. I believe that that speaks directly to the core desires of our heart, the way that God designed us. There's a longing in us that we want to be chosen, that we want to be set apart for a purpose, that we want to be loved. And all of that, that's the great gift of God, is all of that is found in Him. And He knows who we are. He's a good daddy. I got to think about it. Like He's not, he's not trying to manipulate me into to behaving right. He's actually trying to love me into that place. And He's actually giving me freedom and responsibility. And my my choices, they do have consequences. You know, the oven is hot. And if I touch it, it hurts. And it's going to have an impact on me, an impact on other people. And, and I, I do, I feel this in my own heart that, that God is, 
I think he's, he wants to work on our character. He wants to work on our character. That, that not only... Um, <clears throat> I was talking to Danny Silk about this. And uh, he said that... He said, you know, a gun. Used a gun as an analogy. And he said, if you just have a bullet... And the bullet, the context of our conversation was we were talking about the power of God, healing and the supernatural and the power of God and all of that. And he's like, if you just have a bullet by itself, then it's a bomb and it can be destructive. But if you have the gun, that's the casing and the way the gun, he was trying to explain what, how the gun works. I don't really know how it works. I just know you pull the trigger. Um, but the gun represents humility. It represents compassion. It represents honor. It represents like that is what we are bringing the kingdom of God. We're bringing the deutimus, the power of God, but it's cased in humility. It's cased in love. It's cased in peace. And it's cased in meekness that this, this is the character of God. You've got the fruits of the Spirit and you've got the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit. And it's like you need both of those operating in our lives. And, and, and so I just feel like God is speaking to our character. It's, yeah, it just matters who we are. It matters who we are. And people are looking for something that's real. They don't want to just see the show. Like people want to see something that's authentic, that's real, that's truth. So God, we, we want to be the people you've called us to be. I encourage you to expose yourself to God and the things of God. This will renew your knowledge of the image of God. You know, that's why for me, when I hear somebody getting healed, I'm just like, wow, that's so fascinating. Like I, I don't... I don't know if this is really fully true, but it's like I don't, I don't want to ever be the same because after I've seen that, because I've seen God move, I've seen what's possible with Him. Who God says I am is the foundation of my thought life. That's the foundation of who I am and who, the way I think about myself. <clears throat> if you're able, can you stand with me? I just want to pray for you. Just heard the word. I feel like God is just washing some of us. <laughs> I feel like He's just washing. He He washes. He's really good at washing away fear, washing away condemnation. You know, there's some things that we have to put off, but there's also some things that we have to put on. And it's important that we put on the right things. Sometimes along the way, we started to put on the wrong things, even after becoming a Christian. And so God wants to just wash us again with His compassion, wash us again with His, His, His humility, with His joy, with His peace. I, I, I do just sense this. I just feel like there was condemnation, that places where we felt condemned, where we beat ourselves up. And God's just washing that away. He's just reminding us that our identity is secure. And I feel like He's given a rest where you can rest in the security of your identity in Him. Like it, I feel like some of you need to hear it's not on you. It's not on you. You, can, you, can, you put something on you that wasn't, wasn't meant for you to put on you. And I think once we put those things off, we start to find out our true self, and we actually show up in grace. We show up in love. We show up in humility. And we show up in the power of God. And so, God, I just pray for just a washing over us today of your love, of your compassion, of your goodness. And, God, I want to remind us in this place, God, that you say that this is what Paul says. So if you've got a problem with it, you can deal with Paul. But he says you're chosen. He says you're holy, and he says that you are the beloved. <clears throat>